the kindness of the organizing body in inviting me to speak at this conference. I apologize that I couldn't be here yesterday. I heard it was an excellent day, but I'm delighted to be able to participate this morning and in particular to participate after the two excellent presentations we have had so far. Um, I'm not somebody who's politically correct, so I will simply say I'm as blind as a bat, so I shall have to uh, use my reading glasses from time to time, but I won't bore you by reading out the whole of what I've got. It would, it would, got, it would take too long. The topic of humane vitae and uh, in the light of the Synod on the Family. Uh, one great advantage of humane vitae with regard to Amoris Laetitia, which obviously I haven't been able to read, but I have uh, been given last night a, photo, a, a printed copy of it, is it is far, far shorter. Um, <laughs> And it seems to take a lot more seriously the request of Pope Francis in Laudato Si to spare the resources of the earth. <laughs> the, of, course, of course, there are a number of pontiffs who could be very long-winded. Uh, Pope John Paul II was one of them. Um, he never, if he could say something in 50 pages, he never put it in five. And his catechesis, of which we've heard this morning, are enormously complicated and enormously long. I said to somebody once, thank God phenomenology is not necessary for salvation. <laughs> but the, the importance of those texts is that they do contain a vast wealth of truth. They are an invaluable resource for thinking about the mystery of human life and the mystery of sexuality and marriage and the issues that are condensed into very brief but very important paragraphs in Humane Vitae. I'd like to take a step back because I think it's important to have a proper context for thinking about the Synod and Humane Vitae and, and what I'm going to say. I'd like to turn to somebody who was one of the greatest pastors that the world has ever known. Uh, we sometimes hear, and in fact we hear quite frequently, that it's not a good thing to have somebody speaking in very abstract, technical, doctrinal terms. And that we need to have pastors who are in touch with their flock, who have the smell of their sheep, who go into the geographical and existential peripheries and who can bring the mercy and compassion of God to the people who are in dire need in very varied and difficult situations. That is obviously a, a proper concern, a very proper concern for any pastor at any time, at any level in the church. It's enormously important. But it would be quite wrong to think that being a good pastor is something that can be divorced from doctrine. And it would be a grave error to think that people who are good theologians are not better pastors because they are good theologians. The greatest uh, well, one of the greatest pastors the church has ever known was a very powerful theologian, enormously complicated. But he knew his flock. He got to know his flock in various places in very short time, in various geographical peripheries. <laughs> 
and in very real existential peripheries. The pastor I'm speaking about is St. Paul. St. Paul, in the first letter to the Corinthians, in chapters 5 to 7, deals with various questions of sexuality, amongst other things. It is true that St. Paul was also someone who engaged in dialogue. It is true that St. Paul engaged in very delicate matters of dialogue and was able to convince St. Peter that the way Peter had compromised a particular way of, en of uh, initiating new Christians was wrong. He did this at the Council of Jerusalem and we know that amongst other things from his own letter to the Galatians and from the Acts of the Apostles chapter 15. It could be said, indeed it has been said, that the Council of Jerusalem is a model for the Synod of Bishops, and that can be so, and should be so in many ways. But the dialogue in which Paul engaged was not in any way a way of diminishing the proper Petrine mission in the church, not at all. Paul knew of the existential realities, for example, of the port of Corinth and of the grave systematic sexual immorality that was rife in that port. And that is the background to what he uses in 1 Corinthians 7. And it is in 1 Corinthians 7 that St. Paul articulates Jesus' teaching on marriage and on indissolubility. And he does so in a way that makes it clear he cannot change what he has received from the Lord. And in a second stage, when he applies the Lord's teaching to a new situation in his various communities, one that Jesus had not had to confront, he still gives authentic teaching and as an apostle and with authority and he applies Jesus' teaching as closely as possible to what Jesus himself did, said and indeed in two of the three applications exactly as Jesus had said it. Why do I say this? The first letter to the Corinthians, which I presume you know is not the first letter to the Corinthians because that got lost in the post somewhere and we've never seen it, um, however, has three sections in which St. Paul exercises magisterium. 1 Corinthians 15, where he gives us the creed and the salvific core of our faith. 1 Corinthians 11, where he gives us the liturgical expression of that faith in the mystery of the Eucharist, and 1 Corinthians 7, where he deals directly with Jesus' teaching on marriage and indissolubility, which he does not dilute. The church has to be faithful to the teaching of Christ. And it is wrong, indeed it is a total distortion to accuse people who are anxious that that teaching might be compromised of being Pharisaic or legalistic or out of touch with reality. That is simply not true of many of the people who have been and who are deeply concerned that some ways of trying to relate compassion and mercy to truth may be going beyond the limits of what is right and proper. Let me say that Paul VI 
wrote Humane Vitae in the light of Gaudium et Spes in the Second Vatican Council, which is a very, very rich document. The section on marriage in Gaudium et Spes is enormously rich. And he did not want to repeat that. He expressly stated that he was not intending to repeat all of what had just been said. But the council had not dealt with the question of contraception directly, because the, or at least the new question that had arisen about it, because the Pope had reserved that to himself as the Pope, precisely because it was such a delicate and problematic question. The consultations that took place before Humane Vitae could not change constant church doctrine. Why not? Because a majority report or majority opinion cannot make falsehood into truth. And that is just as true with a synod of bishops as it is of a pontifical commission. Truth is not a matter of majority opinion or public opinion, and much less is it so when it concerns the truth which Jesus has revealed and which has been transmitted in the tradition and which someone as new as St. Paul could simply only accept and transmit in his turn as a condition of being faithful to the Lord Jesus Christ and to the mission of the church. The pastoral concern of mercy and compassion is not remotely new. It is something that has accompanied the church throughout the ages. Thomas Aquinas is the greatest theologian that the church has ever known. And he was both profoundly acute in his analysis of the questions he faced and very aware of many of the existential situations in which the gospel had to be lived. The patron of moral theologians is St. Alphonsus Liguori. And he was both a tremendous pastor who organized the popular missions of the Redemptorists in the parishes of the Catholic Church in a way that was transmitted and continued for 200 years and more. Mercy and compassion are also clearly evident in Humane Vitae. The difficulty with Humane Vitae is that people speak about it without reading it. I know that for a fact, because many years ago I had to teach uh, a group of teachers in my diocese uh, various things on moral theology, and I refused to treat sexual morality until I had dealt with fundamental moral theology. And when I asked, that came to a section on sexual morality, I simply said to them, would you tell me your objections to Humane Vitae? And I wrote all of their uh, objections on chart boards, these flip charts that were common. I come from a bygone age. And, <laughs> and I, I covered all of these things and I said nothing. I made no comment about anything. I wrote everything down. I can write very quickly. And then I said, uh, now, who has read the encyclical? And nobody actually, I mean, I had read it. I promise you I have. <laughs> uh, but, uh, they, <coughs> some people said, well, we've, we've read reports of it in the Catholic press. So I said, well, you don't want to believe everything you read in the press, not even in the Catholic press because they take bits and pieces and they don't always put it in context. 
So then I said, well, then you are committing a grave injustice against Paul VI, against the Catholic Church, and against the people you are teaching. Because if I, in my background, was a historian, if I were to talk about something without having looked at the exact documents, people would have crucified me. So why do people feel that they're able to talk about these things without knowing what is actually said? I then said to these, if you had read this, you would not have said this or this or this because Paul VI says exactly that. There is in the synod process that we have um, been living in the last few years, there is a great deal that seems to me to be very positive and enormously helpful. But there are aspects of what has been produced in these recent years that are extremely worrying, at least they're worrying to me. So I would like to take just a few points. It is not unusual for a synod process to be complicated and it is very usual for the concluding document, the apostolic exhortation, to be very long. Almost all of them have been very long because they try to do justice to the various bishops, the various positions, the various opinions that have been expressed. Some of them contain useful presentations of doctrine. A lot of them are very verbose, but they do contain some important sections of doctrine and clarifications of doctrine at certain times. There has been a synod on the family before, in 1980. And that synod was very fruitful in the post-synodal apostolic exhortation familiaris consortio, which was written by John Paul II. In some ways, it gives a better presentation of his thinking than his very, very lengthy catechesis because then his thought is more condensed. It is cited repeatedly in all of the synod documents that I've seen, and I've seen references this morning because I only got the text very late last night of the new apostolic exhortation, and John Paul II's catechesis are amply cited. Familiaris Consortio is regularly cited, uh, as is Gaudium et Spes. But there is no doubt that the core of Familiaris Consortio on, in relation to Humanae Vitae confirms unequivocally the doctrine of that encyclical precisely in relation to responsible parenthood and in relation to contraception. And it produces a synthesis of John Paul II's uh, anthropology or theology of the body by describing contraception as a, a profoundly contradictory act. In fact, it goes further. Uh, the Pope says he uses what's called the language of the body and says that there is an inherently contradictory body language when contraception is used because the conjugal act is and ought to be an act of total mutual self-giving love and that total mutual unconditional love is contradicted by contraception which is a giving that is conditional, limited, and partial. And therefore, the act of contraception, according to John Paul in Familiaris Consortio, is nothing more than a lie. 
in body language, and that is the language of the Pope. It's not an invention of mine. There are other things in this document that are enormously enriching because the Pope, it's not true to say that personalism began with John Paul II. It didn't. It is not true to say that the language of the body or the theology of the body, the theology for, perhaps, began with John Paul. It didn't. There was much written in the 70s on these themes, but they were profoundly problematic. What John Paul II did, amongst other things, was to correct the distorted view of personalism that had arisen in the 70s and 80s and possibly before, and to establish a more precise or an adequate anthropology and a, a more precise and profound uh, vision of what Paul VI had called the unitive meaning of the conjugal act and by implication of the whole of the married life of the couple. He was also deeply aware, because the Synod had made it clear, apart from very problematic writings in the 70s, that the pastoral approaches to questions of conjugal life which had been put forward were often themselves seriously questionable. In particular, people had proposed that there should be a gradual pastoral approach. People can't always um, change from a, a, an immoral way of life to a perfectly virtuous way of life like that. They often need to, to progress in stages, in steps, and so on. So people spoke about a so-called law of graduality. But of course that can be a total distortion of the truth. It can be a cover for, for sanction, uh, sanctioning what the church itself has condemned as intrinsically immoral. And so one of the key things in Familiaris Consortio is that the Pope distinguished quite clearly between the graduality of the law. What is that? That means, oh, well, look, you're in a difficult situation. You've been living an awful immoral life. Um, it would be very difficult to expect you to be faithful to your wife or to stop contracepting or to do this or that or the other. Let, try to reduce it. Try to cut it down. In other words, the fullness of the moral law doesn't apply to you. That was rejected, quite rightly rejected, as an, an entirely improper and misleading pastoral approach. I regret to say that that version of graduality reappears frequently in the synod documents of this of the last two years, quite clearly reappears. John Paul spoke about the law of graduality, not the graduality of the law, and expressly rejected the graduality of the law. Father Lombardi, the spokesman for the Vatican, has had to work overtime in recent uh, in the recent years, and at one stage in the discussions, I think, of the 2014 session of the Synod, had to admit publicly that a lot of the bishops at the Synod simply did not understand the law of graduality, and they had confused it with the graduality of the law. Uh, they had. Let's turn to the Synod itself. It is radically new in some of its methodology because Pope Francis wanted to have an open dialogue with everybody at all levels of the church. And so the, the, uh, the document, if you like, a, 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 an initial document called Lineamenta or guidelines was issued which for the first time had within it a questionnaire. 
and uh, then the, 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 the linea mentor was sent to all the bishops' uh, conferences, the bishops of the church and various other bodies and uh, experts. The reactions were evaluated and were fed into the 2014 session, and in fact fed into a document called the Instrumentum Laboris, a working document for the 2014 session. And it produced, the end of that session, produced a relatio finalis, a final report, which Pope Francis said would constitute the linea menta, in other words, the guidelines, the framework, for the 2015 synod. And then a further instrumentum laboris was produced. It would be tedious to go through all of these things, I can tell you, because I've done it. Um, but uh, I would like to say something about the linea menta and particularly the questionnaire of uh, which in, began in 2014. <clears throat> I don't know whether you've ever had anything to do with questionnaires. Uh, I loathe them personally. But I have had a doctoral student who was uh, a lady who some years ago was doing research into matters connected with practices in uh, medicine on the borderline of uh, euthanasia. And she wanted, amongst other things, to use a questionnaire to enter into her research. I can tell you that the complications of getting approval for a questionnaire to be used in doctoral research are enormous. And the scrutiny of the questions and the structure of the questionnaire are put, uh, are, uh, given, put to minute examination. Why? Because many questions can be ambiguous, so open-ended that they could mean anything, or they could be leading questions. In other words, they more or less invite a particular answer uh, and therefore they're not really objective. My answer to this sort of thing is that all questionnaires should always be translated first into Latin. <laughs> and there's a very good reason for this. Because in Latin, if you pose a question, if you use the word none, you expect a positive answer. If you use the word num, you expect a negative answer. So only those questions that are properly translated into Latin with a suffix ne are remotely valid for any questionnaire, leaving aside any other questions of the viability or the reliability of the questionnaire. If those criteria had been applied to these linea menta, uh, they would have been changed radically. Um, they are, I'll just simply say, I'll read this section if I may. Much could be said about the idea of the questionnaire, questionnaire even though it is, in, it is stated that the aim was to involve the local churches in the synod process. In fact, many of the questions are so general and vague that they could be word interpreted differently in different places, which would mean effectively that people are often answering different questions which, of course, would call into question the analysis of the result. For example, what is meant by the question? What the question is, uh, was about the real knowledge of church doctrine. What do the people posing the question mean by real knowledge, as opposed to knowledge that is unreal? Why should people be expected to be aware of magisterial teaching from the Second Vatican Council onwards? The church didn't begin with the Second Vatican Council as far as I'm aware. And if we don't have a hermeneutic of continuity, we lose powerful insights from people in the church's history who have contributed enormously to our understanding of marriage and of the conjugal life. For example, St. Augustine, whose goods on marriage are the backbone of church doctrine. 
whose goods on marriage are the content, the objective content of the questions posed to spouses in a wedding ceremony and which appear also in Canon 1101, paragraph 2 of the Code of Canon Law, at least for the Latin Church. Question 1b contains, first of all, a num question and then a none question, which as such should not have been included. Is magisterial teaching fully accepted? Well, the obvious answer is no. I mean, that's what they want to hear, so that's what they would hear. <laughs> are there difficulties in putting it into practice? Well, of course there are, otherwise there wouldn't... <laughs> Question two, in my opinion, suggests, shows how little understanding the Secretariat for the Synod has, I've lost my place, um, of um, the existential peripheries. Since most people, the, the, if you ask people in the street, what do you mean by natural law? Of course they will look at you and think you are mad. In other words, the people framing the questions have not realized that they need to, people understand natural law, but not the terminology of natural law. So they need to frame the questions in a better way. Question four asks about percentages of couples living together as an experiment and then of others who are separated and divorced and so on. Well, how would you find out that? It's guesswork, unless in every uh, conference of bishops, the bishops find statistics from state authorities or other bodies that are reliable, and in their answers, give express attention to official statistics that are in some way confirmed. Otherwise, the whole thing is guesswork. Well, that's very, very shoddy in my uh, in my opinion. The specific questions relating to procreation are, in my view, very inadequate. Again, there's this num question. Is there real knowledge of Humane Vitae's doctrine on responsible parenthood? Well, there clearly wasn't in the Secretariat. Um, the earlier part of the Linea Menta had deliberately refrained, it can only be construed as deliberately refraining from addressing this question in any adequate way at all. This doctrine, of course, is not limited to the encyclical, but if you read the Linea Menta and the various documents produced by the Secretariat, you would get the impression that the, the, the doctrine on responsible parenthood and on contraception is something to do with humane vitae and only with humane vitae. Well, of course, that's simply false. There is an excellent historical study um, on contraception, uh, which was produced by an author whose name now escapes me, uh, but anyway, uh, it was written in the hope of proving that contraception was not the constant doctrine of the church and the man had enough intellectual honesty to conclude that in fact it was the constant doctrine of the church. He then said, well, it ought to change. Uh, but it is simply for, it is wrong to give the impression that only um, Humane Vitae deals with responsible parenthood. The, this, the, the question then proceeds immediately to speak of different <laughs> methods of regulating birth. And this is a, a, a feature of the, very, the two linea menta and of the two instrumenta laboris. And from the glance that I gave to it, it appears to be so in Amoris Laetitia, but I couldn't say that with certainty. Namely, talking about methods of regulating birth, without any attention to intentionality, which means that the whole focus on responsible parenthood 
misses a very, very important, indispensable part of Humane Vitae. At least in the questionnaire it misses it. Another num question, is such moral doctrine accepted? Um, this is followed by other questions that prove that the answer that was expected is no, it's not accepted. Uh, why? Because it then asks about the most problematic aspects in the majority of couples. Well, if you've already worked out that the majority of couples don't accept it, of course you pose the question, well, what are the, majority, what are the problems in, in these people? In other words, I think that the, the question is, uh, the, there are questions here about, about uh, the percentage of people who deal with this in confession or who go to communion. Well, how would any priest know? How would you know? I can say that not many people confess this sin, but some people do. That, that people do confess this sin. And the real question is, what do they understand that they've done wrong? Where is their, if they think it's a sin and they've confessed it, then what do they understand about the teaching? Is it that they've misunderstood the teaching altogether? Is it that they simply think they're wrong because they judge that they ought to limit their family? Sometimes that does appear to be the issue. Well, there the answer is quite clear, at least part of the answer is clear. You say to the penitent, penitent that is not contrary to church teaching. That is a requirement of what you and your wife or you and your husband should take into consideration and it's expressly stated that you should do so. Now you can't leave things there. You need then to go on to say that the, the, perhaps the, 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 the question that worries you more is uh, what should you then do about it. But that's the kind of pastoral discernment that can and should be undertaken by a well-trained confessor, faithful to the church's teaching, dealing with a penitent, and who is able to deal with this question because the penitent, in revealing his conscience to God, has revealed it to the priest who is there to act as the minister of God's mercy in that sacrament. Um, let me move to the Instrumentum Laboris for the last session of the Synod, for the 2015 session. Um, in this section, I have focused pretty well exclusively on what is directly said about uh, responsible parenthood questions of procreation. So, um, it, this Instrumentum Laboris is very helpful in the way it's produced because it contains what had been said in the linea menta, and then it has, in a diff uh, it has additional numbers and in a different type of print, uh, the, the collection of the various responses and the analysis of the responses that emerged. Number 57 of the final uh, report of the 2004 Synod had been supp supplemented by a note um, of requ request that there's a need to, di to, di to divulge magisterial teaching. In other words, it's, there's a real need to let people know what the teaching of the church really is because people don't always know about it. It's not well presented. There is a lot of a need for centers to be established to help to work on research on fertility and infertility, dialogue with bioethicists, and there's a need to, dive, to involve biological experts in the process of preparing people for marriage and accompanying those who are married. Perhaps I would say not, I would say moral theologians who are well prepared, uh, which would include bioethic, bioethicists. There is also a need, and this is absolutely true, a need for people to become involved more politically so as to influence legislation on questions of life and to be able to promote human life from conception until natural death, also at the level of international institutions. So that um, 
paragraph of the Instrumentum Laboris is, is very, very important and, and entirely valid. But there is an extremely worrying paragraph, which is number 58 of the Instrumentum Laboris, so 58 of the Relatio, the, the final report. The Instrumentum Laboris remarks <clears throat> with direct reference to what it calls the wisdom contained in Humane Vitae in relation to the matters treated. That two poles appear, uh, emerged, in other words, two radically different points of view emerged from the comments that came back on the final report of the 2014 Synod, which was the discussion document, the linea menta for the next session. Two poles appeared. One emphasized the role of conscience as, and it quotes Gaudium et Spes, Second Vatican Council, the place where the voice of God echoes in the human heart, um, which has been trained to listen to it. So it's not quite a quotation, but an allusion. The other pole was the, ob the, that of objective moral guidance, uh, which prevents us from considering generation as a reality about which we may decide arbitrarily. That's quite, in other words, if, if you talk about objective moral guidance, you're, you're, you're not saying, well, whether we have children or whether we seek children or not is just a matter for us to make up our own minds, as if we could do that in a morally correct way just simply by exercising our liberty as we see fit. So the concern of this poll was that such arbitrary behavior in relation to, to responsible parenthood instead needs to be properly guided uh, by the divine plan for human procreation. And then the text of the Instrumentum Laboris proceeds and says, when reference to the subjective pole prevails, there is a risk of egoistic choices. In the other case, in other words, where the objective focus prevails, the moral norm is perceived as a weight that cannot be sustained and which does not correspond to the requirements and the capacities of the person. Now, I didn't make that up. That's what it says. What's worse is that it continues. <laughs> <laughs> the, conjunction, the conjunction of these two aspects, the two poles, subjective and objective, lived out with the guidance or the accompaniment of a competent spiritual guide, whatever that may be, doesn't say a confessor, doesn't say a priest, doesn't say a bishop, it might be some free-range individual who thinks they've got all the capacities that God wants for them to guide other people. So the conjunction of these two aspects lived out under the guidance of a competent spiritual guide will be able to help spouses to make choices which are fully humanizing and which are in conformity with the will of the Lord. End of quote. Well, quite frankly, that is either utterly unrealistic or it's a complete travesty. If there is, if the objective moral norm expresses a moral truth, if it expresses a, a moral truth in such a way that it is said to be intrinsically morally wrong to behave in such a way, then trying to put that position together with um, a more subjective position on the role of conscience, I listen in my heart to the voice of God that echoes in its depths, could lead somebody to say, with the aid of a competent spiritual guide, well, quite honestly, this norm of humane vitae, it's, it's just too much. It doesn't relate to my personal circumstances. It's an overburdening, overburdening crushing burden upon me and my wife and my family, this norm doesn't really apply to me, or at least not at the moment, 
Perhaps it will do later on, when my wife has passed the childbearing age, perhaps. Now, you see the problem. If you put that together with the misunderstood or distorted law of graduality, you have a major problem. There is also a misrepresentation and a serious misrepresentation of the doctrine of conscience in this document. Because the Second Vatican Council statement that is partially quoted there was gravely misunderstood and seriously manipulated. There is no reference at all that I've seen in any of the posts of the pre-synodal and synodal documents, none, to the encyclical Veritatis Splendor. Not one. I could be wrong because I'm not infallible. <laughs> but there is not one that I can see. And yet, it was very important that, 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 that John Paul II said, you can't interpret conscience like that. It doesn't mean that I, as an individual, have my private hotline to God, and God tells me that all his norms and teachings don't apply to me and my wife because our circumstances are difficult. John Paul II himself criticised the misinterpretation of Gaudium et Spes. And actually, you don't have to go outside of the Second Vatican Council to find uh, a, a necessary complementary doctrine. You find it in Dignitatis Humanae no, number 14, which says nobody, nobody who ignores, and it doesn't mean that they don't know about, but deliberately ignores magisterial teaching can be acting in good conscience. Nobody who treats magisterial teaching as if it were a mere opinion can be acting in good conscience. Quoting both of those in, a, in an allocution of 1988 to moral theologians after a conference on the 20th anniversary of Humanae Vitae, John Paul II added, and nobody can be acting in good conscience if they treat their own opinion or that of moral theologians as if it were equivalent to the certain teaching of the church's magisterium. So where does that leave us? It leaves us with a big problem. And it leaves us with a very big problem because one of the things I noted in Amoris Laetitia, in the last section on pastoral guidelines, is a, a reference to Thomas Aquinas. Uh, the Summa Theologiae Prima Secundae, question 94, article 4. And you will all immediately know that that is where Thomas Aquinas uses the famous expression, lex valet ut in pluribus sed in pauchoribus deficit. The law applies in the majority of cases and is defective in a minority of cases. He did say that. But he was talking about secondary precepts or, or applied aspects of natural law or revealed law, for that matter, where they are positively expressed. That's the point. That's the presupposition of Thomas. And Veritatis Splendor makes this quite clear. Yeah, it is true that the law applies in the majority of cases where you're talking about what you are positively obliged to do. There can be cases when you, you are physically incapable of doing it or when there is a conflict and you have to defer fulfilling a promise or, uh, and so on and so forth. But what, it, what Veritatis Splendor makes clear in the light of the Catechism and the Church's totally constant tradition, including the very clear teaching of St. Thomas himself, you can't do that with negative moral norms when they apply to what, or when they express what is intrinsically morally wrong. You can't do it. It's gravely immoral. And so, left as it stands there, that is seriously misleading. Very seriously misleading, and that is a great pity. What was needed was clarity. Clarity. 
it is regrettable, very regrettable, that the enormously rich teaching on the formation of conscience that is intrinsic to Humane Vitae wasn't better expressed and articulated in these lengthy discussions and in the various documents. That would have helped enormously. I don't want to be entirely negative because there is a great deal of very helpful material both in the synodal documents and in what I've seen of the uh, apostolic exhortation, very good material on the meaning of love, on the way of fostering uh, people in the preparation for marriage, taking care of couples in pastoral difficulties, the understanding of how love can be nurtured and fostered and cared for, and how it can contribute to the good of society. All of that is excellent. But the nub of the matter for this specific issue is that the, 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 the core of Humane Vitae's difficult teaching has basically not been, let me say, has not, in my view anyway, not been adequately presented and in some cases seriously misrepresented in many of these documents. That I find uh, a great, a tragic uh, occurrence and I find it very problematic. I will conclude by saying, well, doesn't that all change if the Pope were to say something which he I'm sure he has not said, but let's take the hypothesis that the Pope were to say, well, that teaching simply was wrong. Suppose. A Pope, the Magisterium generally, but the Pope in particular, cannot go against revealed doctrine. A pope who becomes mad or a pope who becomes a heretic, it has always been said by moralists, would cease to be pope. There's no question here of any heresy or anything like that. I'm not uh, accusing anybody of that, but just as a hypothesis it is simply false to imagine that the Pope can decide and do whatever he wants. He can't. He is subject to Christ's revelation. He is subject to the tradition of the church. He is bound by the church's constant magisterium. He certainly cannot contradict any dogma. He, in my view, cannot contradict any constant doctrine of the church. If he says something that could appear to be in contrast with the doctrine of the church, particularly a constant doctrine of the church, he would be, in my view, under a serious moral obligation to make it clear to people how what he is saying does not contradict what the church has always held. Because otherwise, there would be confusion and thus malformation of conscience. I think that some of the uh, contributions in the Synod documents have unfortunately not taken um, the need to be clear and precise and to explain how some new pastoral proposal might not be in real contradiction to what the church is obliged to teach as a matter of fidelity to Jesus Christ. Uh, some of the language in the synod documents, not in the apostolic exhortation, as I haven't examined it sufficiently clearly to be able to say, um, some of the, those statements are very, very unfortunately framed in my view and the very good work in many of the other parts of those documents is in some ways therefore um, undermined by these weak and problematic assertions and by the weak and problematic implications that people may draw from them. So I hope that the apostolic exhortation will be read carefully and critically with these 
clear doctrines on marriage, on procreation, and on the formation of conscience in mind. And with that, I uh, thank you for your attention and hope that I haven't scandalized you too much. Yeah.